as I was getting recruited for colleges, one of the biggest things was, okay, well, what happens if I don't get recruited because they don't want to take a risk on somebody who has um, a so-called disability? And so mm-hmm. um, my parents, when I, when I, well, my mom specifically, whenever we went on recruiting trips, she would tell every coach um, in our, in our meetings and, you know, the coaches were like, okay, like who cares? And I think that that kind of helped me um, in high school after I committed and when the stories come out, had come out and in college, it kind of made me realize like I could use this story to benefit other people or benefit the younger girls because our goal is to grow the game and, and show younger girls that it doesn't matter if you have a disability, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what your situation is. If this is something you want to do and you're committed to it um, and you're good at it, um, your disability won't matter. Taylor McQuillan was a four-time all-conference pitcher and an All-American at Arizona University. She's now led Team Mexico to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics, and she plays professionally for the Cleveland Comets. You may have seen Taylor on ESPN last year talking about having Duane syndrome, which made her legally blind in her left eye. But that's just one part of Taylor's incredible story. Uh, you said in the interview that aired during the college World last year that you didn't want to tell people, when you were younger, you didn't want to tell people about your disability because you're afraid that they might take away uh, your opportunity to pitch. Right. So can you talk about how it felt to worry about that happening or how it felt if it did happen? Yeah, I think when I was younger, I just never really told people unless, you know, somebody would come up to me and say, oh, like, what's wrong with your eye? That was the, t- that was the typical question I would get um, when I was younger, especially in elementary school, because kids are kids. So, and I didn't really have answers for them. I was just like, Oh, I was born that way. And that's like all I said. And they were just like, okay. And then walk away or okay. And then continue the conversation. Um, and then as I started playing sports, we just never really said anything to, um, what, whoever my coach was or my mentor was or anything like that. Um, so I did like Taekwondo and a, a ballet and dancing and soccer and swimming. I did a whole bunch of stuff and never really told the coaches. Um, and then as softball became my go-to sport and I realized that's what I wanted to do, Um, just growing up, you know, some coaches knew, some coaches didn't. um, And that's just kind of the way it was. And we just said, oh, I was born that way. Or, oh, I have Duane syndrome. And I don't really know a lot about it. Um, And then when high school came around towards the end of my high school career, um, somebody had looked it up or brought it up or something. And that's kind of when the whole story came out. And when ESPN talked about it in the World Series last year, and it kind of just blew up everywhere, I got emails and and Facebook messages and DMs and uh, Instagram and Twitter from all kinds of people, whether they all kinds of kids and families that say, hey, my kid has a similar situation. Um, And so it was it was awesome. And I sat there and um, after, you know, after everything had kind of died down and I came back home um, from the World Series, I sat there and responded to every single person that had reached out to me about the situation. And it was so cool. And I just remember telling my mom, like, mom, like all these people reached out to me because they heard my story and they wanted to know how I overcame it. Um, and they want their kids to do the same. It, it's awesome to see what has come from my story. Um, and, and not just my adversity that I've overcome, but other people being able to, being able to overcome this similar adversity because they've heard my story. Yeah, that's incredible. I can't imagine <laughs> like reading all those messages. It has to be Really, really powerful. I was wondering if you could share a story of one of the most formative adversities that you faced or failures you overcame, either while at Arizona or now playing for Team Mexico uh, or the Comets. Yeah, um, I think there's, you know, there's quite a few, especially just being um, an athlete at the college level and then beyond. Um, every player that you face is really good. So you just, it, mm-hmm. no matter who you're playing, so you just have to be ready for it. Um, one of the biggest adverse, one of the biggest obstacles that I had to overcome at Arizona was definitely um, the transition from high school and travel ball to college. And my freshman year, I struggled the entire year just mentally, and my confidence was kind of shot. And physically, I wasn't por- performing to what I knew I could perform to. And we were playing obviously all of these great teams, and I just remember losing and losing and losing. And I knew that my teammates were we're struggling too with just, they don't like losing either. We're not, we're not, Arizona's not a losing team. We don't lose. Right. Um, and so to come there and just, you know, struggle with that, I think it just killed my confidence a lot. And so, you know, that summer I just, it was, uh, what am I going to do? Like, am I good enough to play at Arizona? Do I need to, 
look into going somewhere else where maybe I can figure out how to grow or be better. And, and I just sat there all summer and kind of like contemplated what, what I needed to do to be better. And then going back in my sophomore year, I think I spent, um, you know, I had gained a little bit of weight from just stress and probably stress eating and, and not, not being myself or not playing like myself. And so, um, I go in my sophomore year and I just said, you know what, I need to commit to being the best athlete that I can be. I need to fix my confidence and I just need to be able to say, okay, like I'm, I'm going to pitch like Taylor normally does. I need to help my team out. I need to win games. Um, I need to play like an Arizona softball player. And so mm -hmm. I think that the transition from my freshman year to my sophomore year was a whole growing period for me and really getting my confidence back, knowing that I could perform it to the best of my abilities and, and be the type of pitcher that Arizona softball needed. Um, and I wasn't even the ace that year either, but I, I still was the, the second pitcher and I knew that I needed to go out there and win games for us. And I think that just the difference from my freshman to sophomore year, just changing a mindset and, and getting confidence back. That was the huge, like the biggest obstacle Arizona that I had to overcome, just knowing that I was capable of being able to play at the best level. And then knowing that my teammates had my back no matter what. And I think that once I realized that I became a way better pitcher than I was my freshman year. And I really did feel like I, I overcame all of the struggles that I had, not saying that I didn't have any more there, but just the whole freshman year being able to overcome that was, was huge for me. And that was probably the biggest obstacle that I had to face at Arizona. Mm -hmm. So going back to what you said about like, do I, do I deserve, you know, to be playing at Arizona? You know, I can imagine that that would be really intimidating and especially like entering, you know, college and, and, this storied history of incredible pitchers. So yeah, like what was, how do you deal with like the, that history and like that kind of intimidation, but also like inspiration? Yeah, um, I think for me going through, if I take myself back to high school, just going through the recruiting pro process, I remember, I believe it was like my eighth grade year um, and even freshman year of of high school um, when I had um, originally committed, I think that I had coaches that would say, okay, like, what are your top three schools? And, you know, or well, have you thought about it? What are your top five schools? So I, you know, I, I would tell them and say like, oh, like I want to go here or here. And I had coaches literally look me in the face and say, mm, you're in our number three or four pitcher on this team. So I was like, okay, then I'll find a new team where I'm going to be the number one and two, where I'm going to get a lot of innings. Or even if I'm still the three or four, I'm still going to get innings and I'm still going to get looked at. Um, and, you know, I had other coaches tell me, uh, you're not going to make it there. You should look smaller D1. So I was like, uh, okay. So, you know, and, and so then for me, that was kind of like, okay, well, my coaches don't believe in me. How am I supposed to believe in myself? Um, and so I, I found coaches who did believe in me. And um, it's kind of awesome to, to see the development that I had when I had coaches that and, and teammates that believed in me. And I think that my freshman year, I was the youngest person on my travel ball team. Um, and I'll, I had, we had 11 seniors and I was a freshman and our age difference was, you know, three to four years. And so for me, it kind of, it made me grow up a little bit faster and it made me kind of figure out the game a little bit faster. And I think that that helped tremendously. And so I grew as an athlete, but I also grew my confidence level and my mentality because there was, you know, times where I would go out on the field. And every time I went out on the field, I was like terrified to lose because our team just was so on you, so aggressive. So the first to say like, you know, get your ish together or figure it out, or you're going to be off, you're going to be off the mound. We'll find somebody else who can pitch. Mm -hmm. So I was terrified to lose. And then that made me better as a pitcher because it made me want to win even more. And then I realized, yeah, I'm not scared to lose. I want to win. And so my mentality completely switched. And then the recruiting process switched. Then I had coaches that believed in me. And then I had college coaches that believed in me. And so when I had committed to Arizona, um, one of the biggest reasons why I committed there obviously was coach Kendrea. Um, right. but the, the history of Arizona softball is unbelievably amazing. The tradition that they have there, um, you know, the legacy that all of their players have left behind. Um, but the mentality that has continued for the 35 plus years that coach has been there and the, the athletes that have come through the alumni that have been super supportive and come to all the games and, um, interact with the players at, at, at a different level. Um, it just, it's crazy to see that. And I kind of picked up on it when I was on campus. And so just looking at the back wall with 
Susie Para and Nancy Evans and Jenny Finch and all, all, all of the players that have gone through there, um, you know, and, and all of the titles that they've won. I knew that that going there was something that I wanted to be a part of and that, that in, it inspired me to want to be better and want to be like them and, and be a top pitcher that could, you know, take a team back to the World Series and that has a chance to win a national championship. Um, and so for me, all of those trials and tribulations that I had had in the recruiting process and when I was younger turned into, okay, now that I've, I've proven myself that I, I can have a chance to play at Arizona and then getting to Arizona again and going through more trials and tribulations and then coming back and, and being inspired again by new past and form, former and, and current and future teammates. It's awesome. And um, to see the transition that I had there is kind of similar to the, the transformation that I had had in high school from going from nothing to something. So it, it kind of came full circle and then came full circle again when I got to college. So um, two very different experiences kind of tied in together all at the end of my college experience. And that's kind of um, what inspired me to go to Arizona, what inspired me to be the best that I could be. It's because of all the people that have led the tradition there and have turned the tradition into something that um, every year continues to, to get passed along um, and the stories get passed along. Um, mm -hmm. The want and the desire to compete and win get passed along and that's so 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 awesome and I'm so incredibly blessed that I was at Arizona and got to play there and compete there it's just it's amazing yeah and now be part of the stories and part of the tradition and, and yes. on the wall yeah that, that's okay. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to be thinking um when the coach hands you the ball and says all right Taylor you're starting this game like where do you want to be in your in your mindset I think the biggest thing is just knowing that no matter what happens, whenever your name is called upon, when you get the ball, whether you know early or not, um, you, you just got to have your mentality ready. And you just got to say, no matter what, if I'm going in today, we're going to be good. Or I need to make sure my, my bullpen's on. And sometimes I've had the best games. I've thrown the best games in my life with the worst pregame bullpen. I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh my gosh, my pitches aren't working. What the heck? You know? And then, and then, None of that matters. The second you finish warming up, you have to flip a switch and just say, okay, we're ready to go because not every bullpen before the game is going to be great. Um, you know, and that, that's the way it is. Even with position players, you know, you could take a pregame and bobble four balls or make five errors as you would call them, you know, and, and none of that matters because once it's game time, you have to flip a switch. You can't carry that on. Um, and so I think just having the confidence, confidence is huge and everybody talks about it, but um, you got to have the confidence and your mentality has to be so, so strong, no matter what happens. And mentality comes from confidence. It comes from preparation. It comes from knowing yourself and knowing how capable you are of going out there and, and having your C game and still being able to beat teams and perform and um, get outs. And that's huge. Mm -hmm. When you're on the mound and maybe you just walk somewhere and, or you through three it's three and one you know what what do you go what are you thinking where do you go in your head you know when you walk back to the in the circle and, and what do you what do you think about I think um the biggest thing is keeping your emotions very stable and when your emotions aren't stable that's kind of when you, the when pitchers tend to become unstable and hitters pick up on that and teams pick up on that and then pitchers get riled riled up and um kind of get all over the place sometimes and you see that really good pitchers are able to remain calm or doesn't matter what the count is they they, they trust their pitches. They trust themselves. They're, they're still, their face is stoic on the mound and um, their body presence is still strong. Um, and so for me, I think three, one counts. Okay. You know, for me, I'm like, okay, I'm in a three, one count. Yeah, that sucks, but I'm able to come up with a strike without, you know, piping it over the plate. I can still, I still feel confident that I can throw any pitch in any count. Um, and that it'll work. And I think that when you're not confident in it, that's when it kind of just goes all over the place. Um, I, you know, walks happen. They're normal. Um, mm -hmm. You, you want to limit the amount of walks you have. Obviously, the less runners on base, the better. But um, walks do happen. Um, but I think now in this game, it's more common to have a little bit more walks in different situations, depending on batters, because batters are, are really strong. Um, and so some batters are, you know, okay, like, think about this one you have two outs but you have first base open and their number four hitters up and is the best hitter on their team or 
you're facing the number eight batter or the number nine batter and you walk them and you're like, why? Like, what, what was the point of that? You know? And um, to me, sometimes I get frustrated when I walk batters that, um, don't necessarily need to be walked or on base. Um, but so I, I get a little bit internally frustrated, but, um, you can't really see it on the outside. I try to keep everything as, as calm as possible. Um, but it's, it's definitely, I think as you get older, you realize, okay, these are the hitters you want to keep off the base. These are the hitters you want to attack right away. Um, these are the hitters that you're like, okay, you just, you can't leave it over the plate. And you, you pitchers know that, you know, pitch gets left over the plate and it's not a good day for them. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. walks, yes, but walks happen. They're normal. Um, you want to limit them, but no matter what count you're in, you should still be confident that you can throw strikes that you can get out. Um, people get out all the time on three, one counts. People get out all the time on three Oh counts. Um, people get out all the time on zero, zero counts, you know? So it's, mm -hmm. um, you can still get out as long as you have pitches left to throw to that batter, their at bat's not over. And I think that that's kind of my mentality is this at bat's not over. I'm behind in the count, but it doesn't mean I can't give you out. Um, and so I think in that situation, you know, yeah, the hitter has the upper hand advantage knowing that you kind of have to throw a strike, but they still don't know what pitch is coming, you know? And I think that's the best part about it. They, they don't know what pitch is coming. They don't know what the, the pitcher's thinking. Um, you don't really know what they're thinking. So it's anybody's game still. So it's awesome to see that. Yeah, that's awesome. So you also talked about with Amanda, the quote, be where your feet are. And I just wanted to have you, you know, tell me a little bit more about that and what that means to you and what happens when you don't keep that in mind or when you haven't. Uh, always kept that in mind. Yeah, um, this is my favorite quote. Coach Kendra says it all the time. Um, be where your feet are. So basically, it mean, to me, I mean, it means be present in the moment. Wherever your feet are, that's where you are. Um, don't think about the past. Don't think about the future. Take it one pitch at a time. Take it, you know, one batter at a time. Take it one step at a time. Because um, every moment in a game counts. Um, but be where your feet are also can be taken outside of softball. Um, just be present in the moments that you're in, you know, don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on the future. Don't think about the future. You know, um, you have to be present in every moment that you're in because what, what's the point of living if you're not present in where you are? You know? And I use it outside of softball too. I, sometimes I realize that I'll be like walking around or even driving on the road and I'll be like, oh, I'm like not here. I need to be present in what I'm doing right now. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether that's going to the grocery store with grandma or, um, you playing catch with my brother, or, you know, playing with the dogs outside, like just be present in the moments that you're in. Um, and life is going to be so much more fulfilling. And I think that's the same with softball. Just be present in the moments that you're in because they're so great. And I think that sometimes like when you're not present, you don't realize, or you kind of take advantage of the game a little bit. And so to me, if, if I really focus on being where my feet are, calming myself down, just breathing, and it, it's, it's, so much more helpful. I think it just, it's really calming. And so when, when I'm not, when I don't think about that kind of anxiety builds up and then you start thinking about, oh my gosh, like, I know we got runners on first and second. Like, what do we do? Like, there's only one out. Like what if the ball gets hit up in the middle? And then, you know, it just kind of, everything else just kind of goes crazy from there. So um, it's really helped me stay within myself um, and be very calm, I think. And that calming feeling is refreshing and it's not too calm but it's calm enough to understand this is the situation going on. This is what we're going to do. And we're going to take it pitch by pitch. This is the pitch that I'm throwing. All right. I'm hundred percent bought into what I'm doing right now. So um, it's really cool. And I tell all my girls the same thing, whether they're in lessons, you know, whether I'm doing a video chat or whether I'm helping another team out or um, my own team, just be where your feet are. It's a, uh, it's simple, but it's effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that when I, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that. I'm going to steal that. Yes. yes. It's, not, um, it's not my own personal one, but it's, 